First things first, we can't talk about the cube without talking about Sir Jonathan Paul Ive. And that's John without an H for those at home. And when he spells Johnny, it looks a lot like Joni. However, this man, massively influential. Sir Jonathan Paul Ive is a British product and industrial designer, and actually, as of 2012, also a knight. That's why we're saying Sir, my lord. Back in the late 80s, Ive was a student at Newcastle Polytechnic in the northeast of England. And at one point, his designs won him the RSA Student Design Award. This award came with a travel expense account and a stipend to be used on a trip to the USA, where I would get his first taste of American design culture. And while on this trip, he met Robert Bruner, who was a designer who worked at his own firm but would eventually work for Apple and have an influential role in recruiting Ive. After his trip to the States, I've worked at a number of different design firms, but one, named Tangerine, would eventually lead him to the Big Apple, uh, Incorporated, not New York City. Your Mac friend, Brent Rambo. While at Tangerine, he worked on things like microwaves, drills, toothbrushes, toilets, and bidets, of which many of his designs were deemed too modern. I'd love to see what a toilet that's considered too modern actually looks like. You ask me, it probably sucks the waste straight out of your body. So during this time, from 1990 to 1992, when Ive was designing futuristic toilets, his American friend Robert Brunner was working at Apple and working his way up the ladder. He actually tried recruiting Ive a few times, but unfortunately, he just didn't go for it. But as fate would have it, Tangerine ended up taking Apple on as a client. And after working on their account, I was officially recruited by Apple in the fall of 1992. Oddly enough, in his early career at Apple, I've considered quitting a number of different times. But actually, when Steve Jobs returned in 1997, the two of them came together like a creative hurricane. Jobs and I essentially became the spiritual driving force behind Apple's products for the next couple of decades. Ive's first assignment as Apple's senior VP of industrial design was the G3 iMac, which we all know was a massive commercial success. Their color, shape, design, and that convenient handle on the back made them fun and interesting and something that a lot of people wanted to use. Not to mention the marketing materials at the time really focused on how convenient the G3 iMac was. You just needed to plug in the power, and an ethernet cord, and you were off to the races. Presenting three easy steps to the internet. Step one. Plug in. Step two, get connected. Step three, <laughs> there's no step three. There's no step three. <laughs> After the G3 iMac, Johnny I went on to create some of Apple's most recognizable designs over the last 25 years. These include bangers such as the G4 iMac, the iPhone, the 20th anniversary Mac, laptops from the clamshell iBook to the MacBook as we know it today, and of course, the G4 Cube. So these are just a handful of products that he was responsible for designing that left a massive footprint on society. It's no wonder that when he retired in 2019, a lot of people wondered where the company would go without him. What is Apple without the magic touch of Sir Jonathan Ive? And I'm not saying that sarcastically. Anyway, so with our intro to Johnny Ive out of the way, it's time to look at the era that generated this machine. So the project started development in the late 90s. Think about the time. Rollerblading was trying hard to be cool. Fred Durst was busy giving people the finger. And the Y2K bug had us all afraid that local hospital equipment and the days would come alive in the middle of the night, fighting their way to nuclear silos and launching missiles with their minds. Thankfully, none of that happened though. But on a more serious note, it was the late 90s and Apple was on a roll. The G3 iMac was a huge success and so was the clamshell iBook. Looking at Apple's portfolio, for some reason, Jobs wanted a machine in between the iMac and the Power Mac. So development of an eight inch cube began. I have believed in the challenge of starting with form factor first, labeling traditional ATX PC cases as lazy or a convenience for the designer, not the consumer. And he was right. PCs of the late 90s were mostly full-size ATX beige boxes with little to no personality after turbo buttons left the market. I have enough of them now I could build a home with them. It just wouldn't pass code and I'm sure people would think I'm a serial killer. The Q project was an effort by Ive to simplify the computer while also building one of the most complex machines of our time. Since Job had a real bu for fanless machines, the cube was not relying on a heatsink and it used a convection cooling system, as they called it. Essentially, they were relying on air. <laughs> According to Mac Attic Magazine's October 2000 issue, during the early stages of design, Apple hardware VP John Rubenstein, also a John without an H, see where you're developing a pattern here, told his team, start with the heatsink and go from there. So what did they create? 
Well, it was small, quiet, and hopefully would cool itself. Pretty innovative, right? Stephen Levy from Wired wrote of a meeting with Jobs during the release of the Cube. Uh, quote, he began by emphasizing that the Cube was powerful. It was also air-cooled. He demonstrated how it didn't have a power switch, but could sense a wave of your hand to turn on the juice. He showed me how Apple had eliminated the tray that held CDs. And with the Cube, you just hovered the disc over the slot and the machine inhaled it. And the innovations didn't stop there. Jobs was even gloating about the plastic. As he told Levy, or Levy, probably Levy, we're doing more with plastics than anyone else in the world. Quote, these are specially formulated and it's all proprietary, just us. It took us six months just to formulate these plastics. They make bulletproof vests out of it and it's incredibly sturdy and it's just beautiful. There's never been anything like that. How do you make something like that? Nobody ever made anything like that. Isn't that beautiful? I think it's stunning. I think we can comfortably say that Jobs was excited about the plastic. Nonetheless, the problem with the cube wasn't the plastic or how it looked. Visually, it was stunning. The problem was, where did it fit into the market? Steve Jobs' business philosophy for Apple was typically rooted in realism, but he seemed to be punch drunk in love with the look and feel of this machine and was starting to kind of ignore his own principles. To understand Jobs' philosophy of Apple at the time, think of a four square chart. On one side, you have laptops, both high and low end. On the other side, you have desktops, both high and low end. These machines make up the bulk of what people are looking for. Jobs held this philosophy for most of his computer-based product lines, but in this case, pun intended, he fell in love. The smaller, shrunken, fanless design was almost the manna from the heavens that he'd been craving all these millennia. Jobs drank the Kool-Aid harder than anyone else at the company and ended up being one of the loudest champions at Apple for the cube despite the fact that it didn't fit in with his product philosophy. At the time, Apple was offering the iMac and the Power Mac G4, as well as the iBook and the PowerBook. These four products satisfied the bulk of their customers. So what were they gonna do with the Cube? Who was supposed to buy the Power Mac G4 Cube? In his interview with Stephen Levy for Wired Magazine, when asked who would buy these, Jobs was quick to defend the Cube. He said, that's easy. A ton of people who are pros. Every designer is going to buy one. He went on to say, quote, We realized there was an incredible opportunity to make something in the middle, sort of a love child. That was truly a breakthrough. And granted, it was extremely cool and innovative, but there just wasn't a lineup of people ready to buy them. Jobs was hoping that people would see that they're so cool that they would alter their buying patterns, which is dangerous thinking in business to just hope that a person is gonna alter their behavior because your product is so cool is the beginning of a lot of ships that end up sinking. So let's talk about the release. The Cube debuted at the 2000 Macworld Expo in New York City. With a sticker price of 1799 US dollars for the 450 megahertz model and an upgraded 500 megahertz version available at 2299 US dollars. You wanted a monitor with that? The 17-inch studio displays CRT, which is a fantastic monitor. I don't have one, but I wish that I did. We're talking about the one with the big clear bubble on the back. That one could be had for 499 US dollars. Or if you were interested in the 15-inch flat panel LCD studio display, that could be had for 999 US dollars. But for individuals with a taste for the finer things, a 22-inch flat panel cinema display could be had for $3,999. So you think about the value uh, there from a 15 inch LCD to a 22, an extra seven inches was gonna cost you three grand. I bought mine locally for $60. Mind you, I bought mine two years ago. So let's be honest, things might've been a little bit better for the cube if it wasn't prohibitively expensive. The price that they were asking for this with the 22 inch monitor, because we wanna be dramatic, is the equivalent of asking about $10,000 today for a computer and a monitor. Oh, wait a minute, Apple still does that. Actually, they're six times worse in some cases, but let's look at a more reasonable approach. Let's say you go for a base model for $17.99, plus you go for the CRT monitor for $4.99. A couple more peripherals, you're probably looking at about 2,300 bucks. Compare that with the other machines Apple was selling at the time. The G3 iMac, for example, you could get a base model for 799 or a DV Plus for 1299, and both of those came with built-in monitors. Granted, you couldn't upgrade to an LCD down the road, but these weren't even that upgradable either. I mean, these had extra RAM slots, but you couldn't really put a full-size GPU in them, and we'll get into more of that down the road. As far as powerful desktops go, 
The Power Mac G4 sold for between $15.99 to $34.99. The base model came with a 400 MHz G4 processor, while the higher-end machines had twin 500 MHz G4s. So obviously, if you're looking for power, you went with the G4 desktop. And if you're looking for price, you went with the iMac. Not to mention the Power Mac G4 desktops also had a lot of upgradability and expandability, while the Cube didn't even have PCI slots. You know what, to its credit, it did have three RAM slots, a spot for an airport card, as well as Firewire and USB 1.1. So the important question is, who was left to buy these? Well, the answer is not totally clear. Obviously, professionals bought them. I bought one from a layout editor who worked for a local newspaper, and another one from a guy on eBay who could have been anything from a graphic designer to, you know, someone who flashes his p the mall full time. Either way, roughly 150,000 units sold before production was halted. Sadly for Apple, right from the get-go, there were issues with the plastic shells. With it being so hard to cast, a lot of models were shipping with defects, and being a design-focused machine, this ended up being a huge PR loss for Apple. The fanless design proved to be a problem, as people complained that something as simple as a piece of paper on top of the vent was enough to trigger a shutdown to prevent overheating. It was also inconvenient to plug anything into the I.O. ports because they were located on the bottom of the computer. And the buttonless, sense, touch, fancy power button could be triggered by seemingly anything waving past the top of the case. And for an 8-inch box suspended about 4 inches or so above the air, it's pretty darn easy to wave over the top of the case even as you walk past it or as you reach out to shake someone's hand. Because of these failures, and I'm sure some more, Apple posted year-end financials for the year 2000 with a missed revenue projection of $180 million. They'd only sold a third of the cubes they predicted, creating a $90 million shortfall on that skew alone. Retailers were flush with product and looking for answers because they didn't want to be sitting on a bunch of unsuccessful, expensive computers. So what did Apple do? Down the road, they lowered the price on the 500 megahertz models and upgraded some of the hardware, including RAM, hard drives, and graphics cards. But it was a little bit too late. The market was too small, and the Cube had only sold 12,000 units in Q1 2001. That's 1.6% of Apple's total company sales in that period. A grim outlook for our friend, the Cube. On July 3rd, 2001, an Apple press release stated that they would halt production on the Apple Cube. Not cancel the entire line or the philosophy behind it, but halt production. And that's an important detail and you'll find out why in a moment. Back in 2001, Chris Gator, or Gaither, probably Gator, probably Gaither, probably from the New York Times wrote, quote, Apple, based in Cupertino, California, left open the possibility of one day revisiting the Cube idea. The computer maker said there was a small chance that it would develop an upgraded version in the future, but that it had no plans to do so. Natalie Welch, an Apple spokesperson at the time, said, quote, customers definitely voted with their pocketbooks and bought the Power Mac G4 mini towers instead. So now what? More recently in the news, Apple CEO Tim Cook called the Cube a massive failure when he was doing a talk at Oxford in 2017. But I find that people dwell too much on that line because he also sang a lot of praise for it. Cook went on to say, quote, it was a very important product for us. We put a lot of love into it. We put enormous engineering into it. He also called it an engineering marvel. Cook also did say they knew the cube was failing from the first day, but that it was a lesson in intellectual honesty for him as well as the company as a whole. He said they told their staff that the cube was the future and that everything was gonna change after its release. But after its failure, they had to look themselves in the mirror and walk away from the product. Today, the Cube is a huge following among retro collectors. Some people like to noodle with them, some people like to restore them, others like to push them past their limits and see what they can do. I highly suggest checking out Action Retro's video about him playing Minecraft on a G4 Cube and then even hosting a server using old low-end Mac tech. And as far as inspiration is concerned, the G4 Cube led the way on a lot of different products that we see today. For one, it was a leader in miniaturizing components. Its precision machining opened the door for aluminum MacBooks and MacBook Pros. The Mac Mini is one fifth the size of a cube and retains much of its design philosophy. The heavy plastics and forming process were incorporated into future machines. The Fifth Avenue Apple Store is inspired by the Apple Cube. Capacitive touch came back in the iPod and iPhone lines. The Cube's vertical thermal and lattice designs made their way to the new Mac Pro. And the new Mac Studio is another desktop hearkening back to the Cube form factor. All in all, the Cube was objectively a massive commercial failure. But it was also a massive inspiration for Apple's future designs and designs from other companies too. I'm just assuming that bit about other companies, but I feel it in my bones. I'm a scientist. Actually, I'm not a scientist, but I feel like I am in my bones. Anyway, that's it for the Apple Cube from me. I hope you enjoyed this little look down history lane. I think it's a super cool, awesome display piece. 
medium powerful and uh, obviously cool enough to play Minecraft. So um, highly suggest getting one of these if you're a collector and you like noodling around with original things. It's a very unique design. I took one of these things apart on a very old video on this channel uh, to put thermal paste on a bunch of different surfaces. I don't know, other than that, it is So if you like this video, don't forget to check out the old videos on my channel and to like and subscribe. I'm a passionate computer collector from ye old Canada and uh, up here we like to fix things and repaint them and sand the rust out and you know, get them back working to life mode. Ugh, that was an awful outro. I should also say too, if you're interested in supporting the channel, we have links to buy me a coffee in the uh, description as well as to the Patreon. Buy me a coffee is a great way to support a channel if you're not in a Patreon. But if you are in a Patreon for $1 a month, you can get your name in the credits and access to what is starting to be some additional content. So while I have your attention, let's read out the list of patrons that we currently have. A big thank you to all these people for supporting the channel and by proxy, my dreams. So thank you to Andy, David G, Larry C, Justin M, Ron's Computer Vids, Jason S, Adam M, Group Ride, Dave's Vintage Apple Tech, Trina C, Garth B, Mac84, Ethan P, Ron R, Rudy's Retro Intel, Charles from Oz, and SK Link, or potentially Skunk, all in caps. Thank you to those patrons, and thank you for watching this video. I'm the Canadian Computer Collector, and hopefully we'll have more of this interesting historic look at uh, computing as time goes on. I'm off to grab a bag of chocolate milk. You know what I wish is that the disk drives worked on either of these machines. They uh, don't eject or inhale disks, as I said earlier, or should I say as Stephen Levy said earlier, of Steve Jobs saying earlier. <laughs>